Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, May 4th, 2016. Uh, 2016. 2017. And this is the week in charts. Boy, this year has been flying by. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of a busy schedule. So what are we going to talk about? Well, first of all, way back since last, I guess, November, we've been talking about a new bull leg, and I hate to identify or label anything. And uh, recently, we had a bit of a spill in the market, and everybody was saying, I told you, and these people have been calling a top for months, predict early and often, I suppose. And then we broke out again, so it's not the end of the world, and we'll talk about that. And obviously, the indices are consolidating a little bit. Uh, your questions on trading, your stock picks, your favorite stock picks, hold off on individual stock picks until we get to the actual charts. And once we do, and this is for your benefit, just ask about one stock at a time and hit return, and then I'll see it in the queue. If you ask about more than one, out of fairness to everyone else, I'll pick one out of your picks. Uh, just randomly, and then I'll go to the next one. I'll try to get to them all, but if you put them on one line at a time, it's a lot easier. I'm going to continue to follow up on IPOs, specifically this week. We're just going to focus a little bit on the Snapchat, since that's a big, um, well-publicized IPO. And then lately, as you know, if you've been following along since early February, I've been talking about just following the game plan. So this week's focus, we're going to continue our discussion on why trend following is hard. It's a bit of a dichotomy here. In some ways, trend following is easy. You don't do anything. You just follow along. In other ways, it could be quite hard. And this week, we're going to focus on the hard part back again. And WTSHTF, what to do when the SHTF. And that'll make a little bit more sense. Any preppers in here? I think you preppers out there probably know what that is. Not that I'm a prepper, but I've seen some of these videos, and I notice they also, they always say SHTF. That was a disclaimer screen. If you want to read it, if you have nothing better to do, go to my website, check it out. Basically, it says you can lose money trading, but I could sum it up a little bit easier, saying that all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, let's get this snap crap out the way. Will Rogers once said that if IPOs, not IPOs, he said stocks, but it could have just as easily been IPOs. If a stock doesn't go up, don't buy it. And here's the deal. A company that allows you to send pictures of yourself with googly eyes and puking rainbows makes no sense whatsoever to me. But you know what? It's not my job to confuse the issue with facts. www.dont confuse the issue with facts is what I often say dot com so when snapchat came out I got asked quite a bit hey Dave should we buy it and basically channeling Will Rogers I said no if it doesn't go up then don't buy it and that'll keep you out of a lot of trouble and that's one thing that's pretty amazing about IPOs. Obviously, Mr. Rogers was being facetious when he said this, but it actually does apply to IPOs. And a few months back, right around the time Snapchat came public, I wanted to see if I could come up with something simple that would illustrate my point, keep you out of trouble if it didn't go up. And I got to thinking, what about a five-day moving average using a concept, what I call, uh, not what I call, what somebody called after they read an article, uh, of daylight. And daylight just means that the low is greater than the moving average. And my number one rule with IPOs, as we discussed last week, is that don't look to trade them until they've been out for at least five days. And a five-day moving average wouldn't let you trade it until day six. So I said, okay, what if the low was greater than the moving average and it closed at a new closing high. So for uh, me to get long Snapchat, it would have to close above 27. And following this pattern, the low would also have to be greater than the moving average. Now, if you go back and look at other rules in last week's show specifically, if the new high during that first week of trading was set on day one, this would be day one, this would be day two. So in this case, it was day two then I'd also require it to be above that high, too. So this was not the high of the move. And I fleshed that out a little bit more last week. 
So anyway, so far, I see no reason to buy this. Now, sometimes an IPO will come out and then bottom out for months and months and months and months, and that could be a worthwhile trade. Unfortunately, we did have one that ended very badly, which we'll talk about in just one second. Now, I want to continue my discussion until everything uh, stops out of the portfolio going back to February. Now, keep in mind that we do have some new setups that have come and gone, and we had one, we had one turd that we'll talk about here in a few minutes. But the reason I say it's the hardest, easiest thing you ever do is because a lot of times there's nothing to do. So just to recap quickly, way back in February, the portfolio, the open portfolio, that is, was on the cusp of going negative. There was only a $500 open profit left over. And my point was just continue to follow along. And as Ed Sakota sang in the, in the whipsaw song, you get a whip and I get a saw, one good trend pays for them all. And hopefully that one good trend that we have left is going to take care of everything. So let's follow up as of last night. Now keep in mind, the current portfolio is different than this portfolio. And we're going to look at that current portfolio in just one minute. But the only one position that's left over is this Kim, and that's a half of a position. And the rest of them, the ones that are in white, have been closed out. So if you go back to February, again, there was a $500 gain. And then you go in of, as of last night based on the mark-to-market on the Kim and the closed trades from that portfolio. And that's what we're left with. And the reason I'm doing this is hopefully, and I just used the word hope, but hopefully uh, we'll be talking about in, in prior weeks, I say in these open positions, but now it's just one. But hopefully we'll be talking about this one open position for a while, and that'll be a lesson in trend following and how it makes the method work and or how the methodology works because of the occasional big home run. And I'm going to flesh that out in a lot more detail in just one second, too. So for now, we're going to say bye, Felicia, for one more week. Now, getting back to why trend following is so hard. This week's episode is when the SHTF, and for those of you who don't know what that is, I made you a little graphic which sort of gives you an example of what I'm talking about. Now, this is what happened. We had, we were long Twilio, and it was a beautiful setup, uh, almost textbook in nature. Nice IPO coming off of all-time lows. And if you're looking for little clues in here, you had a little gap higher. And you had some nice strong closes. Fairly strong close here. And you had a really tight IPO. I mean, I'm sorry, bow tie. Okay? And by tight, I mean that the moving averages all came together around the same spot. Notice back here they're kind of sloppy. One's doing this, and one's doing this, and one's doing this, okay? But here, you have them all come together in a very tight fulcrum point. And my litmus test there is between three to four bars. If you look at a five-minute bar, it'd be between three and four bars. If you look at a 10-minute bar, it'd be between three and four bars. If you look at a weekly chart, monthly chart, whatever the case may be, three or four bars of trading. So in this case, the daily chart, which I use mostly in my trading, it would be three days of trading. So anyway, it was a good-looking setup, and we were nicely on our way up here to the initial profit target, which was kind of cool. Unfortunately, the stock got creamed overnight in a really big way. Now, here is the mechanical portfolio, and the reason I call it mechanical is whatever I say to do this is how this portfolio gets followed. But in reality, a little discretion can help. So instead of a 2% loss, we ended up with uh, about a 4.2% loss, okay? As you can see, followed mechanically. Now, I want to talk about damage control. And I've talked about this quite a bit. And I know it's kind of a dead horse, but I think whenever, kind of beating a dead horse, but whenever we get a new example, it's important to, to beat that dead horse because sooner or later, 
and hopefully much later, but sooner or later, we will get whacked again. Not if, but when. And knowing these damage control techniques can help to mitigate the damage. Now, before we get started, if you don't have disciplined, disciplined, I sound like Modia, huh? Modia, huh? If you don't have hilar, if you don't have disciplined, <laughs> if you don't have discipline, then just take your lumps. And some of my clients email me and say, "Hey, Dave, this sucks. I know you know it sucks, but I'm just letting you know it sucks for me too." And measure those company, blah blah blah. I just went ahead and took my lumps. That is fine, okay? Because you don't want to end up like that guy, right? You don't want to be the deer in the headlights as it continues to go further and further and further and further against you. So if you don't have the discipline, either A, get out of the trade, or B, get the discipline that you need. Now, it does take a little time and patience, and I'm going to talk about a few things to help you develop that discipline. But this is where I kind of come back to the out-of-body experience if you watch a movie, you get excited and, and it kind of catches you. You, know, you might get scared or you might cry. But you know it's a movie and it's not actually happening to you. But you will feel some of those emotions. But there's certainly a detachment. You're not going to be nearly as scared as if, if there's some um, guy chasing you around the house with a hatchet. Literally, okay? <laughs> but... In trading, if you can kind of, and I read this years ago, and it might have been in a, in a, in a Mark, I'll give Mark Douglas credit because I probably give him more credit um, than anyone when it comes to trading psychology. And I think his first book, the reason that is, is his first book, which, which isn't the most well-written book, if I remember it uh, properly. I'll have to reread it. I've got so many books to read right now, though it's going to take me a while. But if I remember properly, it wasn't the best written book in the world, but it was a good book. It probably the best book out there on trading psychology. Obviously, Livermore's book, Reminiscence of a Stock Operator, would be first on my list. But that Disciplined Trader is a is a good book, and that's Douglas, Douglas's first book. I need to get around to putting a list of books back on the website. Uh, I've got that page. I need to put it back up. Anyway... Where was I going with all this? Um, developing a discipline and becoming a little detached. So it's almost like watching a movie. And I have, and it sounds kind of weird, but it's the best way I can explain it. And it's weird. A couple, I've actually struck a chord with a few of you, like I'm the same way. I actually have a bit of an out-of-body experience when it comes to placing trades. Not all the time, but sometimes. Like if something went past my stop and I know we should go out, sometimes I'll actually exit the trade and then think what did I just do I know it sounds crazy but sometimes you have to just force yourself to do these things and then think about them later so that's one way to get a little discipline in now let me show you what I'm talking about here now let's say you're long a stock and it begins to pull back and your stop is right here we're not talking about something that's sort of broadcast like a big bad news event overnight or something or event perceived as bad and that's a whole another conversation in and of itself but you come in and the next day it gaps below your stop well if it gaps down and then keeps on going you have to have an uncle point you already have the loss from here to here that's a reality okay and I learned this from my future broker very early on first time that I got caught in a very adverse move he's like Dave well you, you got caught in this move why not give it a little while to see if it comes back and see if you can improve upon your exit because you already have the loss so I give him credit for that and it's a shame there's not that many voice brokers anymore I, even when even before I found him I remember I was with a major futures brokerage and I would this one lady would um, seemed to be the one that took my trades. And she was just an order taker. Nothing wrong with that. We all need a job, right? But even as just an order taker, I remember once I went to loosen a stop and she actually said, let me get this right. You're going to loosen your stop, which is something that you don't do, okay? 
And I got to thinking about it. I'm like, oh, you know, she's right. And so I just allowed myself to get stopped out. Anyway, if the gap's lower, give it some time, okay? Dave, how much time? Well, I can't say exactly because it might gap down and keep going for the next 60 seconds or 120 seconds or three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. I don't have an exact time for you. And markets don't work on exacts. Anytime you're exercising discipline, you are using discretion, okay? But try to survive at least the first five minutes, okay? If you need an actual number. But try to survive maybe even the first five to 15 minutes, okay? But at least the first five minutes and have an uncle point in mind. Uncle point means, uncle point means a point where you'll give up. My, I don't know why they call it uncle point. I had an uncle who used to give me titty twisters as a kid and would make me whistle, try to whistle. So maybe that's why until it said uncle or whatever. But uncle is like, okay, I've had enough. I guess like if you're in wrestling or something, it'd be like a tapping out of your uncle point where you can take no more pain. Now, what you're doing here is this incremental risk is not much when you compare it to this actual loss. So you've already got a really crappy loss. You're just giving it a little bit more incremental risk. Now, if you think about what happens overnight, everybody rushes for the door at one time. And when we get to Twilio, we'll take a look at that. And I don't have the volume chart on. I usually don't use volume, but I, I thought it would be kind of fun. Ha <laughs> ha, fun, right? Uh, interesting is a better choice of words to put the volume bars on. And if you look at like Twilio on that first like volume bar on that first five minutes, it was up like this. And then the volume just kind of dried out like that. So that just tells me everybody's rushing in at once or everybody's trying to rush out at once. And that's what causes that gap. Now, let's say you're a market maker and everybody wants to dump that stock on you. Well, you got to feed your family. Okay. Two. So what you're going to do is like, oh, you want to sell me your crap? Well, I'm going to open the stock way down here. I'm going to open it at a level where I think I could bring it back up. Okay. I'm going to open it at, and I hate to use the word value, but like a extreme depressed value point. Knowing that this is going to be at or near the worst for the day, and I could bring this up and roll it out. So if I got to suck up 10,000 shares, let's say, if I could bring that up a point or two during the day by undervaluing it on the open, because guess what? Everybody's rushing for the door to save time. And, you know, he's got to make a living, too. And sometimes he gets he gets caught holding the bag. But if he could bring it up a point or two, he could make ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 on the trade, okay? And I don't know what he normally makes, but if he could do that over and over again in these situations, he's making a little bit of money. But again, sometimes it'll open and keep on going. But have that uncle point in mind. Now, there's a couple things you could do. You could look intraday to get an improved exit, okay? Now, forget about where your protective stop was. That's irrelevant at this point. So a couple of people asked me, hey, David, if it rallies up to where that stop was supposed to be, uh, should it get out there? And that's kind of an irrelevant point. You're just trying to, you're just trying to mitigate your losses by having an improved exit. Now, if it's not too extreme of a gap and the stock goes around, reverses, and it's all the way back up here or close to possibly the prior day's trading, then this might have been the mother of all shakeouts, a TKO type of move, if you will, trend knockout. If you go to my website, just do a search on TKO, and you'll get some articles on that. Also, go to videos. I've got a video. It's pretty good if I say so myself on TKOs. So in some cases, you might actually keep the trade, and I should put in parentheses as a trend follower. Okay, so this move was just a shakeout move, 
and the trend is resuming okay now this is something I use quite often and I recently read that it wasn't Mike Tyson that said it but his trainer but I'm gonna give Mike Tyson credit because I don't know where I could find a picture of his trainer everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face so that's the hard part again that's where that that mamby pamby uh, fluffy out of body experience stuff I was just talking about comes in where you need to to do the right thing and then when you do the right thing sometimes it becomes so uh, I don't want to use the word mechanical but it becomes so automatic when you have to take that action that you don't think about it too much and just do it so it is tough when you're in that situation especially if you're watching your account value erode or you're monetizing that loss or whatever the case may be all these other bad psychological behaviors so obviously you want to breathe the bomb has already blown up you want to seek to improve the situation okay so the worst has has already happened now I know it could keep getting more worse but if it's an extreme move the chances are pretty good that it's been overdone so you can then look to improve upon the situation this morning I was googling wait for it wait for it there was some movie and Braveheart came to mind where they were, where were doing that when they're waiting on the uh, the enemy to attack and maybe it's just every movie uh, medieval movie out there but uh, he was actually saying hold hold and if y'all remember the uh, Braveheart it was a pretty cool scene uh, not cool for the horses but it was <laughs> it was pretty cool as far as uh, battle strategy goes the they were being charged by horses and, and the Braveheart character played by Mel Gibson was saying hold hold and then right when the horse was about to trample them they hold up the spears um, and if I remember the movie quietly uh, as tall as men and some men are taller than others is what the what the comic relief joke was, but they held up the spears and the horses were impaled upon the spears. So it's kind of tough, but you just have to kind of grin and bear it. I'm not saying try to be tough. If it keeps on going, you have to, at some point, you have to be willing to bail. And again, I can't stress this enough. That's what a discipline is going to come in. But if you can kind of hang in there, sometimes, and this is not an extreme example, but notice that that low was hit during the first five minutes of trading. I can't always guarantee that, okay? So from here to here, like I said, is a huge drop overnight. So giving it a little bit more, and I put, uh, for those who needed help, I put 23 would probably be a good number. And notice it did find that low within the first five minutes of trading. Now, keep in mind with markets, they're going to try to shake you out. They're going to try to fake you out. A market will do what it has to do to cause the most pain, the most amount of people. So a lot of times it might get retested. And notice that it did get retested here. It didn't get undercut, but it did get retested. And then it began to rally up a little bit. Now, there's a couple things you could do. You could, a couple of clients emailed me and said they bailed out intraday somewhere in this range as it began to rally towards the end of the day or middle of the day, I should say. And that's fine because if you could get back a couple of points on the trade, then I forget the exact number, but I think that would probably mitigate your losses by about 1% or so. So instead of a 4% loss, now you're down to a 3% loss, which is much more manageable. Okay. Now, you can continue to hold, but just remember that if you hold overnight, you are in damage control mode. And I took a snapshot earlier, and that's about where it was. So you can see from here to here, you have improved somewhat on the trade. Now, you're no longer in trend following mode, so you're looking to improve the trade by getting out at some higher price, but obviously, if it begins to weaken, you don't want to be the last one to get out, okay? So it can become a little tougher. Now, the older me would say no matter what, you need to be out by the close on the day of the catastrophe. But in more recent times, I've been willing to 
stick with things. Now, this isn't a great example, but this was a, a this is a tiny gap in like right around the stop. The stop was somewhere around here, and it kind of undercut it a little bit. Okay, and in this particular case, you can see it finally took out that low a few days later. Now, this one we had already taken partial profits on. I think over here somewhere and the stop had been trailed up. So you're just giving up open profits, or in this case, it might have just been a scratch. But overall, the trade was profitable. So you're in a little bit better position, both financially and mentally, to give it a little bit of wiggle room to see what happens, just in case it was a stop nick and the stock turned around and went right back up. But in this case, it didn't. And the reason I want to show you this was you did lose this much more than you intended to. In fact, maybe it's a little bit more than that on the trade. Well, let's see. A little bit more. I think it nicked out here. So you would have lost that much more, which isn't that big of a deal because you already had a profit on the first low. Now, you don't want to give up that entire profit. And obviously, when it fails down here, you don't want to be like bailing out somewhere down here and losing money overall in the trade. You want to at least be able to exit out with a little bit of money. So giving it a little bit of wiggle room, let's say the stop is here, give it a little bit of wiggle room below that stop, it's okay. But at some point you have to admit, obviously, that you're wrong if you're going to carry overnight. So the question is, do you hold or not to hold after the catastrophe? So again, in a case like Twilio or even Salt, you're obviously no longer in trend following mode unless like in our prior example in the figure I showed where it comes all the way back up and it just kind of looks like a pullback or a knockout move, something like that. So you're looking to mitigate damages. Now, of course, that creates a lot more decision. And in those decisions, obviously comes more stress. Do I get out today? Do I get out tomorrow? So I'll give it this more room, you know, so it's a little bit trickier and you got to be careful because, of course, you're going to have more stress with those decisions. And if you go in and watch last week's presentation, something that I've, did, I've done quite often, you end up with this binary decision tree. And with each extra decision comes more and more decisions. And you don't want to make too many decisions when it comes to trading. You want to make as few as possible. I think it's a better way of putting that. It also puts you in a possible state of regret, okay? Let's say you bail out today and then tomorrow it jumps back up five points. They say, oh, never mind. Uh, we were wrong. It's a do-over or whatever. Some news flows into the market and all of a sudden they, everybody realizes it was a big overreaction. So you got to be careful not to put, you in the state of put yourself into a state of regret. As I often preach, Trading is only two things. It's making decisions and living with them. It's a lot like life. You have to make decisions and you have to live with them. Making the decision is very, 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 very easy to do. Living with it, living with them is not. I'm not going to make the marrying my wife joke <laughs> this week. Stay out of trouble. Um, anyway, so you just can't put yourself in a state of regret after you do make the decision. Okay, So have some sort of bailout plan in mind. Um, there's also, I guess you would call it the possession theory, for lack of a better word. If you read these behavioral finance books, and I've read a few of them. As I said before, I don't want to beat up on anybody, but it seems like they all start saying the same thing after a while. In fact, uh, in Greg Morris's book, he kind of summed them up a little bit, which I thought was pretty cool, and that's that might have led me to read some of these other ones. But uh, so it's like I don't want to give credit to one book over another because by the time I read the third one, I started just threw it against the wall because it sounded the same to me. But one thing they do talk about is when you have something in your possession, it begins to acquire some sentimental value to you, okay? And the longer it's in your possession, the more sentimental value or the more attached you become to that. OK, like uh, I said years ago, I, I broke a friend of mine. I called him up because we had we used to take a lot of the same trades. And I'm like, hey, you're in this and you're in this or whatever, you know. No, I'm like, well, why not? It's like, well, I'm nursing a lot of bad positions. So instead of just cutting his losses and getting on this, these positions, he was nursing them. I'm not even sure what that means. I mean, 
you know, what was the meet the fuckers? You could nurse anything with nipples. I'm not sure. I don't know how that applies to stocks. Okay. <laughs> so there is a, an opportunity co a cost. And what was, uh, what did uh, Livermore said? The chap who carries around a corpse, a corpse, a corpse. How do you say that word? A corpse, a corpse, a dead body <laughs> for a year is in much more worse shape than the guy who just disposes of it. So um, maybe one of you guys can find that quote for me, and I appreciate it. Anyway, so there is this possession theory. Um, getting back to the stock itself, maybe there's there's more to come. Maybe there's more bad things to come, and this might just be a cockroach, okay? And the cockroach theory is that when you see a cockroach, you know it's not just that cockroach in and of itself. There's probably more cockroach. So maybe there's more to come. Have you ever seen the kids book, The Three Little Cajun Pigs? No, but I could probably narrate it. <laughs> so you want to reflect on what happens or what has happened. And you really need to resist the temptation of changing a rule midstream, okay? Because you will occasionally get punched in the face and it happens, okay? And if you go to my website, and this is kind of a long title, Trading Checklist Plus One Simple Thing to Keep You Out of Trouble, uh, you, could, you could do a search on this article or if you just, um, I forget what I typed in earlier, but like change the rule or something here or whatever. Just type in Trading Checklist and you should be able to find it. But anyway, this is the URL right there if you're interested. So this is a trading checklist. And I talk about Greg Morris's rule about not a rule, but basically saying that don't change a rule in the heat of battle. And that's a bad thing. Okay. And sometimes all you have to do is breathe. And in this particular article, I talked about Greg Morris and the flight simulators would wind the clock when they would face him with some sort of like engine burnout or whatever the case may be. So he didn't pull the wrong lever or push the wrong button in a state of panic or not follow the general plan. He would wind the clock, and back then they were analog and the F4s, and that would give him that few seconds to think. And there's, there's, there's actually a physiological reason for that, physiological reason for that, easy for me to say. And that's because your amygdala as part of your limbic system is making these really quick panicky decisions, which is really good. I mean, I grabbed a, a wet towel the other night, and I grabbed the pan out the oven, and that uh, wet towel just went, the heat went right through the, the wet towel and burned the crap out of my thumb and, you know, I immediately threw the pan. Um, I didn't want to sit there and hold it and, like, think, oh, well, that hurts and what should I do? It's like, well, I needed to drop the pan ASAP. So sometimes you, you need to make those quick decisions. If a cab's charging at you, you need to jump out the way. You don't think about the cab driver and whether he likes you or not and all these other things. But in trading and other non-life-threatening situations, you need to be willing to breathe. And, and even in life-threatening situations, because Greg has actually lost an engine on a plane before. And that's when he metaphorically would wind a clock because the when he was flying jets or airline jets, they were digital or whatever. There no longer was a little clock to wind. But he would metaphorically take a breath, you know, wind a clock, take a breath, and give himself a chance to reason through what was going on. So anyway, read the article before I'm not going to read it to you, <laughs> although I feel like I'm beginning to. So you don't want to change a rule midstream. You do want to learn what you can learn from the situation. But realize that sometimes SHTF, okay, realize that it happens. Don't say, well, I'm going to get out every time there's a news event lurking because usually it's not what you know that kills you it's what you don't know that kills you and if you go back and look at like the big winners that we've had in the past some of which we've held for years there were multiple earning periods maybe four eight or twelve or so earning periods so you don't want to bail out especially when you're in longer term trend following mode okay now, keep in mind, uh, it's not you, it's not me, and it's not the methodology. Again, 
Shit happens, okay? I was in uh, line once at the store, and uh, the lady behind me could probably best be described as uh, Medea. That's why I'm thinking about Medea today, I guess. And um, I think my wife was with me, and she said something or something happened or whatever, and I said, shit happens. And I didn't realize this lady was standing behind me. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. And uh, she's like, sometimes, twice, you know, <laughs> so... Ever since that day, whenever something happens, I just think to myself, sometimes twice, kind of laugh to keep them crying in these situations. Um, so again, it's not necessarily the methodology, and it's not necessarily you. And I know when you're trading, you put a lot of pressure on yourself. And just remember that stuff does happen. And the only way that you're ever going to make any money trading, and this goes for anyone, whether you're a trend follower or not, is to capture a trend. And Covell wrote, I wish I could quote him directly, I'm trying to think what he said, but there's something that everyone follows, there's something every successful trader, trader follows whether they know it or not. And my corollary to that, which I posted back to him on Facebook, was every profitable trade must capture a trend. So that's why that's why I'm a trend follower. And some say trend following moron. <laughs> I put my little picture of my button in his in his post and he got all upset. He thought I was calling him a moron or something. He didn't he didn't know that I'm a trend following moron. Anyway, but just remember that sometimes trends end badly. All trades eventually end badly, okay? Fortunately, not always this badly, but sometimes they end badly, sometimes they end abruptly, and sometimes before they even begin day in in this particular case. Looks like we had a really nice trend beginning, but then it ends. Now this exemplifies why the outliers are so important in your trading and being on the right side of the outlier. Okay, in other words, capturing that longer term trend. And the way I do it is I find out or seek out, I should say, a market that has the potential to make a short-term move and then if it works out I take a short-term profit and then I trail a stop to hopefully and there's a word hold but hopefully stay with the trade for a long long time now if you're not familiar with the black swan Nicholas Tlaib wrote a book I hate the book I love the book you know it's kinda like he points out that just because something never happened doesn't mean it can't happen. Okay, and I've been part of many black swan events more than I want to admit, care to admit. There's a two drink minimum on some of the black swan stories that I've had in my career and been involved with. But it happens, okay? And and by the way, if you are going to trade, it's always good to play devil's advocate. As opposed, you know, in life, you really want to look for the positive. Nobody wants to hang around somebody that's a, that's negative, right? You know, what, what's, the, what's the old saying? You're a radiator or you're a drain. You don't want to hang around drains. But in trading, you really have to be your own devil's advocate and ask yourself what could go wrong and what would I do if it did go wrong. But the black swan just talks about, like, people who thought they were smarter than the market, for instance, LTCM. Anybody here know what that is? I know a lot of you younger guys in here have no idea. Long-term capital management. They thought they were smarter than the market, and they were using extreme leverage and arbitrage situations to capture a tiny little bit of money. They were risking a tremendous amount of money only to make a very little bit of money. So even in something that seems safe, you have to be really careful if you're over-leveraging because something bad could always happen. A friend of mine, Peter Moffey, tells a story of, I forget whose fund he was um, working with, but they got a signal to buy like treasury bills or something. And because of the volatility of treasury bills was so low, they were supposed to buy a billion contracts or whatever. Just something that was ungodly, an ungodly number, which could have easily blown up the fund should something bad have happened. Now, Treasury bill, something bad happened, that's highly unlikely. But just because something is highly unlikely doesn't mean it's possible, okay? Just because you've never seen a black swan 
doesn't mean that they don't exist. Guess what? A black swan, I was sitting in my office one day, a black swan landed in my pond. My hand to God, okay? I've got pictures of it somewhere. This is not a picture of it here. I was looking, I look, I've been looking forever to try to find those pictures because I wanted to use it in presentations and I had to find one in clip art for uh, today's presentation. But trust me, black swans exist. Just because you've never seen one doesn't mean that they don't exist. Now, because of the black swan possibility, black swans and gravity, taxes, death, and now it seems like kale, <laughs> you can't seem to avoid, right? won't go away. So regardless of what you do, you must position yourself for limited losses and unlimited gains and not just the opposite. So along those lines, I would tell you to run, don't walk away from so-called income-producing methods. I, I wish I would have saved it off, but I don't want to throw anyone under the bus in particular. But I do remember getting one track record from someone, and it looked pretty good. This thing just chipped away at it, chipped away at it, chipped away at it, and they had several years of data. And then I looked at it, and there were hundreds and hundreds of trades. I'm like, okay, well, it still looks pretty good, on the surface at least. And then I started doing the math on everything, and this guy's system made $30 per trade on average. And that got me to thinking, okay, well, he's showing this great track record but he makes $30 per trade. So if a black swan event comes along and let's say he loses $10,000, how many trades will he have to make to get back that $10,000? A lot, right? Let me just do the math on that real quick. You know, he's going to have to have 333 profitable trades. So you get the idea, okay? Let's just say $1,000. Well, that's 33 profitable trades to get back because of that situation. So regardless of what you do, you have to position yourself for limited losses and limited gains and not just the opposite. So run, don't walk away from so-called income-producing methods. I could probably write a system. Of course, I don't know if I even have TradeStation anymore. It's probably on one of my computers in storage. But I used to do a lot of programming and and I had this fantasy for a while with these 90-something percent profitable systems. And they're pretty easy to write. You just take little profits, okay? Use like uh, take profits at one with a risk at three. And it's going to be pretty damn accurate. And it's going to work. It's going to work quite well until it don't, okay? So the outliers on the winning side are important. So if you look at this, and again, I always track things publicly, mechanically, so nobody can, can argue about what I'm saying or what I said in hindsight or whatever, because there is no hindsight. But if you took the mechanical loss on this, it would be a loss of minus 4.2%. Now, it just so happens, and again, this was not by design, because if this was by design, I wouldn't have that 4.2 loss in there to begin with. But it just so happens that our one big winning trade is exactly 4.2%. Now, it doesn't always work out this way, but in this particular case, you could see that having that one big trade kind of saved your ass, okay? It sucks. It still sucks. Okay, I'm not trying to sugarcoat this. And if anything, I want today's presentation to be shit happens. Okay, sometimes twice, if anything. But I want to show that it is important in order to survive this business, you have to make as much money as possible on your winners. And some people say, well, how much is, a is enough? It's never enough on a winner. Let me reiterate that. It's never enough. 73%, that's not enough. That's not enough. 100%, that's not enough. 1,000%, that's not enough. But, Dave, how many trades make 1,000%? Not many. 
but so what? Okay, if you quit at 100%, you'll never make 200%. If you quit at 200%, you'll never make 400%, and so on and so forth. So you've got to just crush it when you can. Now, there's nothing to do once you're in a good trade like this, but just follow along. There's no action that needs to be taken other than put the stop in and forget about it. Go have lunch. Do that every day and let it unfold. But the point I'm trying to make is the outlier is key. So let's say if we were only making, let's just say, 50 bucks a trade, and then we had a $4,000 loss, what's the math on that? 80 trades? So you kind of get the idea, right? There's an old commodity adage, don't eat like a bird and defecate like an elephant. I guess poop is the title of today's uh, show. All right, lots of questions coming in. Any questions on damage control or anything uh, relating to the slides? And then we'll get to questions in general. And let's go ahead and open it up for uh, individual stocks. And I'll start just a one, one line at a time, and then we'll start looking at those as soon as we get done with the markets. Uh, a couple of announcements, and then we'll go through those questions. Hey, guess what? Finally, finally happening. I'm launching on Monday, and there's going to be at least uh, four – uh, videos in the series for starters and then it's going to be a complete course and with everything I do I just I have a bad habit of adding and adding and adding and adding and never getting done but finally I think I've got it to a point where uh, it's done so if you want to be part of that this annoying little pop down thing or whatever you want to call that comes up I couldn't make it any smaller with all the information I wanted so my apologies but just click here and then after Monday this is going to go away but after Monday, if you just go to DaveLander.com slash coming soon, you can get in the list. And then after that, uh, after it launches, um, it will actually redirect you to an opt-in page from there. But right now it's coming soon, and then I should, I should change this early next week to where it will still bring you to a page to get you started. And I'm pretty excited about this. It's actually coming out uh, really good. And I, I worked on this for about two years, so... If you guys think otherwise, let me know because I guess I need to know now before I finish rolling the whole thing out. But it's uh, pretty cool. Okay, Jill says, would you please pick a stock that would be a home run hurting from Twilio? I feel your pain, Jill. I'm working on it, okay? Howard says, stocks split without the extra shares have to be also. My lesson is... I don't look at buy before earnings. No, see, that's not – see, you're putting, you're putting a rule into place, and you can't have a rule. You, it, unless that's going to be your rule, and that's how you want to trade, it's not my way or the highway. But like I just said, if, if I backed out every stock that had a news event and never held it, then I never would have that occasional big outlier – to take care of the occasional loss. And again, it's not what you know that usually hurts you. In this case, it was, I guess. But it's not what you know that usually hurts you. It's what you don't know. Okay? So don't, I wouldn't make a, uh, I wouldn't make a rule. I mean, that's just my personal opinion. Okay? That and five bucks won't get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks, right? I also realize bad news only counts when it does. Well, yeah, that's true. Can be released any time, not just earnings, right? But it does seem bad frequently news occur frequently after earnings. Well, I mean, who knows? Um, you know, that's where you're going to have to take an all-or-none approach. And some people pick and choose, and that's where they get into a lot of trouble. So you're going to have to get out of every one of your stocks right before earnings or not take a position right before earnings. And that's going to have to be your rule because... If you pick and choose, you're liable to get the bad ones. Good things happen too, okay? So you don't know that there's going to be good news or bad news. And more importantly, you don't know how the news is going to be perceived. When you get whacked on something, there's always going to be that little voice inside of your head saying, oh, man, I should have gotten out. But you don't know, okay? And, and like I said, again, on these big winners, you know, how long have we been in uh, – Kemet, I forget. It's been months, right? Well, how many earning periods have they had? At least one or two since we've been in it, okay? So I don't think you can create a rule, and I think that gets you in a lot of trouble. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, Sam says, for earning events, I substitute options for stocks. I live in my risk. On Twilio, I sold the stock. I bought the call spreads. Well, if that's what you do, if you trade options, and you're really good at trading options, or you know what you're doing, then by all means, that's fine. But you're creating a lot more moving, what's the word, moving parts when you start messing around with options, okay? And let's say you said, well, let me just hedge. Okay, so you hedge and nothing happens. Then whatever you paid for that hedge, you've lost, okay? And it, it starts getting complicated really fast. But if you make options your life, then by all means, it's fine to do things with options, okay? No problem with that. All right, let's uh, take a little bit. Black Shoals created by LTCM. Well, Black Shoals wasn't created by LTCM, right? Or somebody in there created it? I don't think so. PhDs, quants. Well, there's been some models that actually have worked. Uh, but the problem is once, if you, like a Black Shoals type of model, if, um, if it widely catches on, then it stops working. I know someone, I'm not going to mention his name, but he invented an option model years ago and he sold it. And he claimed that it was a, a billion dollar mistake. Because the person, the broker she sold it to, said that, uh, you know, we're, we're going to keep it under control. And then all of a sudden, they, they squeeze the edge out of the market really quickly. So there's nothing wrong with developing a, a model. Just know it can go wrong. All right, let's take a look at the overall market. And then uh, we'll start getting into those individual stocks. All right, let's take a look at the overall market. First of all, let's take a look at the P's. Kind of hanging in there. Not much to write home about. Shorter term, just kind of this little tight little range in here. Volatility is dropping. Somewhat longer term, too. Look at that HV of 7. So I would brace for a big move here soon. And by the way, I, I know... We're in May. Uh, sell in May and go away. That that that's a fallacy. That doesn't necessarily work. Clients of mine, if we have a shitty summer, they're like, Ooh, "What if we just sell in May and go away?" I said, "Well, that's not an actual thing. Doesn't actually work. And if you did test the math, maybe it's more like June. But as Tom McClellan pointed out, things that rhyme, you know, hence the uh, or for example, if the glove doesn't fit, you must quit. Tend tend to be believed like seventy three percent." More of the time, I don't know, statistics. Statistics, yeah, statistics are worthless. 74.5% of all people know that. Anyway, S&P hanging around these all-time highs. And here's the thing. Trends can come along any month of the year. Yeah, I'm dreading summer. I hate summers. Absolutely hate them. But every now and then, a big trend will come along during the summer that could actually make your year. So you have to be here grinding it out and doing your work. Now, if the overall market chops sideways for the next month or two, then we'll just become very selective and not put on a whole bunch of new positions and just kind of bide our time. But trends can come along any month of the year, even summers, so you have to trade the summers, okay? Doesn't mean you have to trade like a like a rat getting its cocaine, you know, push the button, push the button, push the button. Maybe you just sit back and let things unfold, but it means you have to be present to win. P is just off all-time highs again. You know me, I like to see a breakout, see them not look back for a while, but as I've been saying, when the market is at or near new highs, new all-time highs, give it the benefit of the doubt. Don't go super crazy bearish because, as I said last week, a market only spends 4% of its time at new highs. The rest of the time, it's backing and filling. Okay? Write that down. I got that from Greg Morris. NASDAQ, nice breakout and tag. Nice little gap on this run higher. Nice persistent move higher. It's going higher day after day after day. And now we've got a little bit of a pullback. But that's okay. And it'd be great if it pulled back but didn't pull all the way back to the base. That's actually a tradable pattern. I don't like to trade in the overall indices because they tend to be efficient. Okay. But it would certainly be a positive for the overall market. Let's take a look at the Rusty. Rusty's a bit of a bummer because the Rusty has tried to break out. 
about a week ago. Now it's pulled back into its range. So we're back into sideways mode. If you don't know anything about technical analysis, then just do a net net analysis and say, okay, well, where are we back in December? Somewhere around 137.75. Where are we now? Somewhere around 137.75. Hmm, let me scratch my head. What difference is that? Well, it's less than a quarter percent, okay, on a net net basis. Very important concept, a concept that people often forget about, a concept, and I probably shouldn't bait you right now, but if you come to these shows or if you've been to these shows before, you watch a recording, you'll see a lot of people ask about stocks that haven't gone anywhere for months and months and months. The net net change is nil, and some, sometimes when stocks are looking to buy, it's actually zero. Now, there are some areas that aren't looking so hot in here. Energies, for instance, uh, imploding a little bit or continue to implode, as to say, let's say UUP. Um, the dollar has been weak in here, and in spite of the weak dollar, energy continues to slide. So, you know, that tells you something right there, and that's I'm just kind of thinking through this. If you read the books on intermarket technical analysis, and I would suggest you read Murphy's book, it's pretty much the only one I think there is. It's a good book, but you can't time off of it. That's the problem. And even Murphy says there's long lead and lag times when it comes to intermarket technical analysis. So intermarket technical analysis, there are certain logical relationships like, okay, well, oil is priced in what? Dollars. Okay. So if the dollar value is going down, it's going to take more dollars to what? Buy oil. Okay, so the dollar is going down, but oil is going down. Okay, dollar down, oil down, something's up. So I would avoid energies right now like the plague. You can see it look, look like they're in trouble. Metals and mining, another one of those areas that should be benefiting from a somewhat weak dollar. Notice that they're continuing to implode in here. So I would avoid the metals too. Now on the upside, most technology related areas look like the NASDAQ itself. They're mirroring the action in the NASDAQ. So their software looks pretty good. Semiconductors, they look okay. They they looked a little dubious a couple of weeks ago. Now they're back just off of these multi-year highs. So so far so good there. Health services up near new highs. Nice persistent breakout remains attacked there. So most areas, without boring you too much, I know, too late, still look pretty good. Transports look a little questionable, but they're not too far from all-time highs. They look kind of toppy in here. But what's the rule? If a market is at or near all-time highs, then give it the benefit of the doubt. So let's give it the benefit of the doubt for now. Some of these areas that look pretty ugly a while back, such as the banks, have now come back a little bit in here. I wouldn't rush out and buy them but I would hold off on shorting them at this juncture. Let's take a look at bonds real quick, and then we'll, um, we'll jump out until your, uh, your stock questions. The bonds are kind of bottoming out. Now they've come back into this range. That's okay. The good news is it, they're not becoming a route lower like they were back in October and December, or even September, October, and December. September, October, November, December. I was like, kind of... Was that in a kind of reminds me of the uh, guy for the month, the Thursday, the Tuesday, the Wednesday. <laughs> anyway, break the coffee, half a cup of coffee tomorrow, day. Um, but the good news is rates aren't going straight up, at least not anytime soon. So we don't have to worry about that today. Check back often is what I usually say. What's a oil commodity doing? Yeah, see, oil of commodity is getting uh, whacked in here. I saw somebody on, I don't know why I let myself do Somehow I got signed up for some Facebook stock groups, and I've been getting sucked into that a little bit here and there. But all I have going on, I'm getting sucked into that BS, and somebody was, they wanted to buy oil. I'm like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, you people. Anyway, you can see oil is banging out new multi- month lows and not too far off of multi-year lows. Now, I'd be fine with me if it went down to brand new multi-year lows and then possibly begin to set up 
maybe like a week. Keep an eye out for a weekly bow tie. If we make new lows first, that could be the mother of all trends in oil, and you could hit three or four hundred percent move. It's like a what all these ads. If silver only returns to its highest level that was, then you would make a eight hundred percent return. Well, you know, if my aunt had, you know, she'd be my uncle. Anyway, big uh, hypothetical question. But you know, what would the world be without hypothetical questions? So. Scholes also won a Nobel Prize prior to his hedge fund crashing. So Scholes was part of LTCM? I did not know that. Okay. It worked for OJ. Yeah, it did. Ah, I did, I did not know that. Okay, so Scholes was a principal and a partner of long-term capital management. Interesting. Learn something new every day. Thank you, Howard. All right, let's get into these stock picks. QTM, Floor Andre. Um, this was one of my first stocks I ever bought. I think it was a QT. I think it had four letters back then. Let's see what's happening here. Um, kind of wide and loose, somewhat longer term. It's breaking out. Let's see if it can continue to break out and maybe look to play uh, pullbacks along the way on that one. BRKS, and there's somebody else was asking me about that one too. Um, I like this stock. There's a couple things that um, that you need to pay attention to, or I, it just needs a pullback. It's certainly trending. The HV isn't super high. It's a little, and yeah, the volume's okay. It's, it's got okay volume. Um, the HV isn't super high. You can see it's this move is only what four points from here to here. But it looks okay. And as a general statement, it's kind of a box stock. It bases, it goes up, it makes a base, it goes up, it makes a base. Okay. A la Darvis style. Darvis wrote a book, How I Made Too Many Dollars in the Stock Market. Good book on kind of an introduction to technical analysis. And basically, Darvis would buy things that went up. So I can't argue with that too much. The problem is, how do you identify these box stocks? Now, many times... Not many times, but sometimes we're fortunate enough to get long these stocks on, on patterns such as a TKO or something like that. For instance, like the Kemet. And then it goes up, makes a base, goes to space, and then hopefully makes another base. Toka, thank you, Marcy, <laughs> for IPO. Why are we thinking Marcy on that? I am long this stock uh, for what it's worth or, or just full disclosure. Uh, this is a case of if you go in that little pattern I talked about, or I've been talking about lately, I haven't added it to the IPO course yet, but it uh, requires two things. that You actually would have gotten in a little bit earlier based on another one of the patterns, but based on the moving average pattern, we need two things to happen. One, we need the low to be greater than the moving average, and two, we need to close at an all-time high. Okay. And if the high was set on the first day of trading, which it wasn't, it has to be an all-time high close, not closing high, okay? Close at a new high period, I should say. I got all tripped up in that last week. But I'll think Marcy on that one. I-N-A-P weekly chart, low volume. Yeah, it's pretty low in volume. Not too bad, though. Uh, well, on a weekly basis, I guess it'd be a good problem to have. It has a tremendous amount of overhead supply. Um, too many days in the pullback. And then your net-net, there's that net-net problem. Now, net-net can be tricky, so I shouldn't have shown that, but in this particular case, because once it makes a new high, your pullback is off that high. You don't want to look at the net. That's what a net-net gets a little tricky. But even if you're looking at it off the high, you went, what, three, four, five? So it's, what, a month, six weeks? So that's too many days in the pullback. Usually I like a pullback about 10 or 12 days. TRVG. TRVG is in a nice trend, okay? And that's kind of like an IPO type of deal. Um, if it pulls back a little further, I think it'd be worth setting up. But you have to look at the magnitude of the move higher. So it made this really fairly sharp move higher. So you want a little bit more pullback in here before looking to get long on that one. But, yeah, put it on your watch list for sure. For sure. MDXG. 
Uh, certainly trending, certainly looking pretty good. Uh, maybe on a pullback, it did clear this prior high in here, so that's certainly a good thing. It's kind of wide and loose and all over the place longer term, but it doesn't mean that you want to completely ignore it because in more recent times, it has begun to get its act together, so to speak, and it also looks like it's accelerating its trend. So, yeah, put that on your watch list. UCTT, another one in a serious uptrend. UTCC or UCTT. UCTT. Yeah, uh, put that on your watch list on a pullback, right? Okay. XENT, never heard of it. XENT. Um, never heard of it because it's not set up yet, but yeah, it looks interesting. Um, it does have some bad memories, but it's not like a big wad of overhead supply way back here, so I wouldn't get too excited about that. It was about three or four years ago, possibly on a pullback. I, I hear you. It does have acceleration. That's one thing that Big Dave likes. I think I'm going to talk about myself in third person the rest of uh, this presentation. Big Dave likes acceleration. Toka, we covered. SQ and X. Brett, you're next. SQ and X. Oh, Brett's got two. Okay, we'll look at both of them. Okay, that's a semiconductor. Uh, not bad. Um, you know, one thing is they just made this one wide range bar higher, and that was kind of the crux of its trend. Ideally, in an ideal world, I'd like to see a little bit more trend. Check back next week. If it pulls back a little bit, we'll take another look at it to see. But in an ideal world, again, I'd like to see more of a breakout instead of just that one bar up. But it's improved today, or yesterday, I should say. So let's just come back to that one. But, yeah, I like the fact that it's a, a first pullback after a base breakout, but it's not set up just yet. Brett, that shop is going to be trending. I don't know if it's going to be set up. Uh, it's definitely on my momentum list. Keep it on your momentum list. You know, the problem is if it pulls back too much, it'll be back into this prior base, and I'd leave it alone. But, yeah, that needs to go on your momentum list, your watch list. C V G I C V G I. Yeah, it looks good. That looks pretty good, Andre. Uh, yeah, I like it. I mean, it's not too far from these prior highs in here. That's okay. Um, yeah, I think it looks pretty good. A, a tiny bit more pullback would be nice. I mean, if it was down to about eight or so, but that's certainly a good-looking stock. It's a. It's almost a high five, and that's your best one for today, certainly. AYX for Brett on a breakout. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's an IPO. Now, IPO is a little bit different, a little bit trickier to trade, but let's just, to make life easier, let's put in my little uh, patent, uh, Dave Landry's IPO five-day moving average breakout system. I need to put my name on it. My wife tells me. As I've said before, put your name on something. John Bollinger did it. He was pretty smart. Like, yeah, I know. I need to do that. I need to remember to do that. I see my stuff on the Internet all the time with absolutely no credit. Let me see if I can fix this chart. I got a window I can't find. Hang on one second, guys. Uh, but, yeah, this could actually trigger on the close today. Now, this is a good example because the – now, keep in mind it's thin, so be careful. It's super, super, super thin, but let's just forget about how thin it is. Notice that the new high was set on day one. That means somebody fudged up, okay? Somebody fudged up and that they set the price too high. Set the price too high, it's going to die, okay? Glove doesn't fit, must have quit. Set the price too high, it's going to die. So – it would actually have to close above this high here, and it's also lows above the moving average. So, yeah, absolutely, that looks pretty good. Dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. That's why I said it three times because it's dangerous, but certainly worth a look. Click. Um, at first glance, it's kind of interesting. At, at With a little bit more analysis, though, you can see that it broke out. It did kind of pull back to its to its base. It looks okay, all right? Kind of a TKO type of move. I think it's okay. Um, entry would be up here somewhere, but have a stop down in this base around 20 or so, maybe a little bit further into the base. 
just in case it doesn't continue higher. But that one's okay. It's not bad. Not quite a high five. If this was a little higher and this didn't come back to the base as much, it would be a high five. But you're you're in the hunt. I just don't like the fact that it came back to the base. Oh, it's okay. Talk about delts. Yeah, this doesn't really jump out at me. Uh, it's kind of thin and it's lower priced. The combination of the two, yeah, it's just kind of all over the place. I hear you, though. I know what you're saying. You're saying maybe it's kind of bottomed out. A little too dangerous to trade. A little wide and loose. I think I would pass on that one. CVGI. Yeah, we talked about this one. This one looks good. It needs a little bit more pullback. CBGI wasn't the trigger today. No. No, because the pullback is not far enough, okay? Um, I'd like to see a little bit deeper pullback. It had a pretty good run from 550 to 9. What's that about? 40%, 50% round number. So 72%. It made a 72% run, so I'd like to see a little bit deeper pullback on that. So, no, I would not get in that just yet. And then, no, the entry... Even if you were to enter it, you'd want to give it more wiggle room than just right above the prior high. Read the chapter on entries in uh, layman's. I think it's called May I Have Your Order, Please? And I'll be covering that in uh, Trading Full Circle. Yeah, this looks kind of interesting. It's got some really bad memories way back here. But that was a few years ago. Maybe a little bit more pullback. It is a little bit thin and cheap, but a little bit more pullback. Maybe if it's like pullback to like 360 to shake some people out. But I hear you. It broke out of a base. Again, it's kind of thin, though, as you can see. So be super careful on that one. WCST from Mr. Howard. WCST. Another one of these uh, media stocks. Kind of thin. Fairly thin, kind of uh, all over the place longer term. I hear you, though. Uh, it looks okay. I mean, you had this, you got this extreme wide range bar here, and then it broke above it. And I mean, it looks okay, but I think it would pass. It just kind of jumps out at me as being a, a very squirrely stock, okay? Very dangerous to trade. MDXG for Mr. John. MDXG. Um, put that on your watch list. Did we talk about this one? Yeah, it needs to be in your watch list, but it's not set up at the moment. Maybe on a pullback. Did we just talk about this one? I don't remember. But if not, it does have acceleration. Look at this. Nice little acceleration and trend. So on a pullback or a TKO move, absolutely. Put it in your um, watch list. Mac forming a base. Well, there's nothing to do if it's forming a base. So as trend followers, I hear what you're saying, though. You're saying it's bottoming out. Yeah, I mean, this might be worth watching to see if it could break out and form. Let's see if it has a bow tie or something in it down here. No, not really. Kind of slow. Yeah, it's okay. It's hard to get. I wish you could get. Let's see if we could do this. Make it a little, eh. It's hard to get the scaling right. I mean, it looks okay. I hear what you're saying. It's basing out. It's kind of got a Phoenix attribute to it. Um, it can be a little squirrely at times. Look at this crazy wide range bar here. Maybe. Maybe if it breaks out on a pullback. I don't know if I'd rush out and trade the, the bow tie on that one just yet. Okay, we talked about that one. Okay, any more? Got a quiet bunch today. XRF for tomorrow for Brett. Let's take a look at that. That's going to be an ETF, right? No, no, no. Okay, China. One, two, three, four, five. The high was not set on the first day of trading. Let's throw in our moving average. And it's not going to have one yet. So, yeah, uh, for tomorrow, possibly. Do you have the, Brad, do you have the IPO course? If you do, I need you to go in and watch something in there. LLNW, Limelight. 
Yeah, this looks good as far as being on, uh, put it on your watch list. But it's not uh, set up just yet, okay? Uh, it does have some, I usually prefer them when they're in longer term trends like this to have be making brand new highs. But this was a few years ago. So you're probably okay on that resistance. I just like to see maybe a little bit more pullback after this uh, base breakout that it's made. But yeah, put that on your watch list for sure. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry, I wish I could, but everything I learned is from your weekend charts. Ha ha. <laughs> yeah. I read somewhere, don't do a don't do a job of um I forget how they said it, something about with content. Don't train everybody to get all the content for free. I think I'm pretty good at doing that. Um, this has gotten through this overhead supply here. It's kind of wide and loose. Uh, and then it really hasn't, it really hasn't taken out. It had this big gap higher. I just don't like the way it trades. Now, if it gets its act together, it begins to accelerate higher, maybe on a pullback, but it's just too Squirrely, HV is 104. Um, not that I wouldn't buy a stock with a high HV, but that's you need to kind of pick them apart a little bit once you get into those uh, triple digit uh, HV numbers. Cool in retrospect. Well, now it's got too many days in the pullback, obviously. But yeah, it was okay. Um, it did have some issues. Uh, it did have all this overhead supply, but obviously that's a good problem to have. Um, it had some issues along the way, and that's why I didn't go after this one. SQ. Jim, you're next. Yeah, on a pullback maybe. I mean, it's breaking out the new highs. Um, but it hasn't really broken out decisively from this base just yet, so I'd like to see a more decisive breakout. Jim says EXTR and a pullback. Um, well, we'll have to see it. You know, we got this one big up bar here. Sometimes if you get what I call a, it's kind of a silly name, but an Arbalist TKO. I guess you call it a Big Dave TKO. Put my name on it. But sometimes when you get a super wide range bar higher followed by a super wide range bar lower, that could be a good pattern. So that's the only way I could kind of see it setting up now. If that doesn't happen, I prefer to see more um, more bars in the uptrend. Okay, we covered that one. We covered that one. BYSI. Did we cover that one? Uh, no, we didn't. Uh, super duper 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 thin. Uh, too thin. It's just way too thin. Uh, it traded, what, 800 shares today? You know, go and buy a thousand shares, you'll be the entire float for the day. So yeah, leave that one alone. Let's not even talk about it on a hypothetical basis. Somebody's gonna get hurt on that. You know, keep in mind with technical analysis, and this is something that sometimes people don't understand or forget how you want to look at it, but you have to have a representative sample. Okay. Now, again, I do like thinner stocks and smaller cap issues as a general statement. But you will need a representative sample size to make the technical analysis work, okay? And on something this thin, you don't have that representative sample size. I mean, somebody could come in and just, somebody could come in and crush your stock if they wanted to. IMGN. Um, it didn't get past this prior little base that much, okay? So that would not be... That would not be a setup. Put it on your watch list if you want. It does have some bad memories along the way. Um, I think I would pass unless it got above like six and pull back a little bit. But I just don't like the fact that it didn't get past this part of the base in here. LPX. Sounds like a utility. It is. Well, the HV is not as bad as I thought it would be for a utility, um, but notice that it broke out of a base and then it came back into the base. So I would avoid, I would avoid that one. And that's some of the stuff that I put into um, 
put a lot of these things into the to that return to profitability course and I, I made sure I, I covered the um, let me show you I made sure I covered a lot of the things that you're going to see for instance in the in the weekend charts and let me see if I can get the slide to come up for instance this is an example here okay it broke it broke out of the base but then it came all the way back into the base okay so that's that's a very simple pattern to look for and notice how my textbook example is almost exactly like this LPX I could actually we could substitute one stock for the other so something simple like that can keep you out of trouble and because the course is mostly focused on the basics I didn't want to get into a lot a lot of details but I wanted to have enough in there that would get rid of like 80 to 90 percent of all the problems with stock picking and, and as I I haven't recorded yet, but as I'm going to say in the stock selection part, this is going to cover most of the problems that I see in these weekly chart shows. You know, I hate to beat you guys up too much because somebody was whining to me a while back, said I never liked the stock that they pick. Well, you know, pick better stocks. <laughs> you know? If I tell you every week it's too wide and loose, find something that's trending, you know. Anyway, I'm sure he's not here anymore. I think I ran him off. TGS. And we've got time for about two or three more. So get them in now. Uh, did we talk about this one already? Kind of thin, not too thin though. Uh, yeah, it's not bad. Uh, it's utility. I'm not too excited about utilities, but the HV is decent. I think it's uh, foreign utility. Uh, utilities seem to be doing okay. Uh, they might be held hostage by bonds at some point, though, if bonds begin to uh, sell off. But let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Getting a little bit too many days in the pullback. Now, sometimes I make an exception, but I think it's got too many days in the pullback. I mean, if you went after this, uh, if it didn't trigger within the next, let's say, two or three days, I would I would not uh, take the trade. But give yourself a fairly liberal entry, maybe around 16. It's not a, it's not bad. It's it's a little bit short of a high five, but it's it's not bad. It's pretty good shot. Pretty good. Uh, pretty good job there. Do I use dollar volume when screening for liquidity? No, but I eyeball it, okay? So if I see a half a million shares traded on average on a dollar stock, I'm like, eh, that's only a, um, what is that, half a million dollars or whatever. So I might be a little bit more leery. But um, you, you can, uh, if you want to do that in IPOs, like at a one-day volume or like a, I use it like a three-day volume actually. Uh, on IPOs and you could you could use dollar volume there's no problem with that but I just kind of tend to eyeball it you know if I see a stock that trades 200,000 shares but it's 50 bucks a share it's like okay well that's a pretty big dollar volume um, one thing I don't like about this one is that it's only got about three points of range in here it seems like if an IPO is going to come public. There's going to be some excitement to it. Let's take a look at the Toka, for instance. Um, you know, this stock went from 11 or 10 to 16, so it made a 60% run so far. Whereas that other one, eh, it's only made like a 10% run, and then it's gave up, given up most of that. So I would put this one in a secondary pattern, and not a pioneer pattern. Pioneer pattern means you look to get in early. Rather than look to get in at 27 or whatever the case may be, 26 or whatever, I would let wait to see if it could blow through those levels and look to play a pullback along the way. So in some cases with IPOs, and there I go telling you everything in the course, <laughs> you uh, you kid, uh, what you do is if they don't have a whole lot of range, then you look for a secondary pattern as opposed to, to a pioneer pattern, okay? Pioneer patterns are going to be the little moving average, the Dave Landry's moving average pattern that I just showed you. Dave Landry's daylight, Dave Landry's IPO daylight pattern. That'll make Marcy happy. So we want something like that. If the IPO has a decent range, if it doesn't have a decent range, then let it prove itself first and then look to play that first pullback or something along the way. Okay, we're going to wrap things up in just one second. DXC. Yeah, this looks okay. Um, but again, it's kind of it kind of has a little bit of a range problem. 
I'd almost like to see this one break out further and then maybe pull play uh, uh, pull back along the way or something. Okay. Okay, I'm just about out of time. Jill, we'll take a look at that one, and that'll be the last one. Uh, no, that's another range problem. It's 12 bucks here, 14 bucks. That's what, 10% range? Let it break out and prove itself before looking to get long. Here's the other thing, too, is what's the story, Fat of Glory? It's a retail apparel store. Now, it might be the, the hottest retail apparel store in Hot Town, but you got to question the chances of it being that are a little bit tougher. So be a little bit more skeptical, especially since it hasn't performed just yet. Wait to see if it can break out with vigor and trend and then look to play a pullback along the way. <laughs> Jill says, despite Twilio, I'll still stick with you. Well, thank you, Jill. I appreciate that. Yeah, I was really, uh, uh, it was not a good day on Tuesday afternoon. Not a good night, obviously. Um, but I want, you know, I really have to, I'm really thankful that uh, that you guys didn't um, crucify me on that one. But it happens, and guess what? It's going to happen again. That's why I want to be, I wanted to come in today's show, and I didn't want to sweep it under the rug. And I wanted to say, look, guys, bad things can happen. You know, I think if I swept it under the rug, I think I would probably, on the surface, look a lot better. You know, but I want it to be real. I want to keep it real and because... I don't want flash in the pan clients who are excited when things are going good and then and then go off to chase rainbows as soon as we hit a few bumps, which we will and which everyone will. Uh, in fact, my best clients are those clients who actually go off to chase rainbows and then come back and say, Dave, I get it. And the only way to make money is to catch a trend. Amen, brother. Let's do that. Let's just follow along. I know I'm not going to get rich overnight. I know I'm going to get whacked here and there, but at least I won't get wiped out. And at least I can live the fight another day. Anyway, I think I've begun to pontificate, so let me stop myself before going any further. As usual, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. If we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a great weekend. Monday, remember, I'm starting that, uh, starting the course on Monday. I'd love to have you guys there. Let me know what you think. Give me lots of feedback. Good, bad, and different. I appreciate it. And uh, because the whole thing hasn't rolled out yet, it's going to roll out over the next few weeks. And I can tweak it a little bit uh, if um, based on constructive criticism. Anyway, again, everybody have a great weekend. Hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week. You're welcome. You're welcome, Brett. You're welcome, Andre.